hear me now? God is not fooled by our pious words of faith. Like our ancestors before us, we have sinned and deserve God's wrath. Yet we come bringing our petitions, seeking a fresh start. Would you please pray with me? Nurturing God like a hen gathers her brood under her wings. You desire to gather your children in your loving grace. But division and disagreements plague us. We cling to rigid certainties, approach each other in arrogance, and fail to listen. We walk away from conflict rather than working through it informed by Jesus' life and teachings. Forgive us, holy God. Help us grow in faith, mature in relationship, and be transformed through your steadfast love. Amen. Rejoice, knowing that God is always near. Our thanksgiving and our supplications are always heard. We are chosen by God to share the mind of Christ. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now let us turn to one another and pass the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Last time I was here, we're, we were all wearing masks. So we're slowly moving along as we go. But it's always out there. We, uh, our family got it this summer on vacation. So always have to be careful. Let us pray. Faithful God, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sanctify us by your word and spirit so that we may glorify you in the company of the faithful through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I'm going to read from uh, three different scriptures today. The Old Testament, the Epistle, and the Gospel reading. Let us begin with uh, Genesis 50, 15 through 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide you and for your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Then in Romans 14 we read Paul's letter, Welcome those who are weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while weak only eat vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of another? 
is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in our own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother and sister? Or why do you despise your brother and sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue confess shall be given praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. And let us sing. Uh, we are living, and it's in your 400, page 400 of your blue hymnal. The gospel reading we read then Peter came and said to him Lord if another member of the church sins against me how often should I forgive as many as seven times Jesus said to him not seven times but I tell you 77 times for this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves 
When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and he could not pay. His Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payments be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of the slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, and then he went and threw him into the prison until he could pay his debt. When his fellow slaves saw what he had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and sister from the heart. These are the word of the Lord. Well, first of all, I apologize. Stopped at Starbucks and it was really crowded. Or I would have been here 15 minutes earlier. And uh, so I apologize. I don't like to be late. Um, the other thing I want to say is, is that... Um, A lot's happened. I, I, I actually, this is the sermon preached on the 17th of September as a lectionary passage. That's why I read all three, uh, Old Testament epistle and, and the gospel. And, but I really wanted to share it with you. But a lot's happened since September 15th, 17th. And so I'm going to try to weave a little bit of that in uh, about what's going on in the Middle East, uh, and I, so I'm kind of thinking as I go. So I hope you'll uh, you'll uh, give me some leeway here. Well, so I'm going on a road trip with a group of men from Woodburn, and we were I decided that we ought to do this as a men's group that we had there, and we were going to go to Dallas and see a train layout that a friend of mine had uh, that was probably almost the size of this building. And uh, he had that many trains, that, that big of a setup, and he had uh, uh, various tracks going to Valdez and tracks to Salem and all this all replicated. And so I thought it would be a fun road trip. So we owned a van, and so we got in the van, about, I don't know, 10 men, and we all headed off from Woodburn to Dallas. And the tank was half full, so I stopped at the pilot on I-5 in Brookings, and I stopped at the first pump, and it said, oh, you have to go inside. Well, I didn't want to go inside. So I went to the second pump. There was a large R RV, and it was going to take forever. So I said, well, I'll go to the third pump. And there had been a spill, and this guy is putting all that sawdust down, and he's cleaning up the spill. So I have these fan full of church people. I'm trying to keep my cool as best I can, display my kingdom theology and my grace. But we did have to make lunch at 11.30 in Rickerill, and the train lay out at 1, and I had all this timeline. So I must have shown my irritation a little bit of what was happening and getting a little bit, you know, uh, nervous. And the attendant could see that I was getting upset. And he thought that I was upset at him. So I began to apologize. He says, I'm so sorry. And I said, no, it's not, it's not about you. It's about those rude people in the RV. And he said to me, just people being people. I went, yeah, good. Thank you for sharing the gospel with me. I really need to remember that. People being people. Well, you know, that's kind of what the scriptures are about today. You know, it's people be people. So how do we get along when people are just being people? 
What do we do with these people that are being people? For instance, new people in the church. Romans, Paul says, Welcome those who are weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while others weak only eat vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. Those who abstain must not pass judgment, for God welcomes them all. See, Paul is dealing with the new people that are coming into the church, bringing all of these new traditions with them. But, you know, the commentary pointed out that I hadn't thought about it. Even Paul showed a little prejudice when he said, don't worry about those who are weak in the faith. So isn't that a little bit judgmental, Paul? You know, some eat anything while those are weak eat only vegetables. So, so you have to confess, you know, that sometimes we, we even, you know, the, the, this phrase is like, when a new person comes in, uh, yeah, um, we're really glad you're here, but, but we don't do it like that in this church, right? We don't do it like that. And so, so it's there, and it's difficult. It's difficult because so often we're passionate about our own beliefs. And we decide what's strong in a belief, and what's weak, and what's right, and what's wrong. And sometimes the issues are so great to us that we're almost willing to lose the fellowship because the issue is so strong. And you know that today, that's really becoming an issue. How strong our issues are over our relationships and our traditions and saying that we don't do things like this. How, so the question becomes, how do we keep our traditions and integrity of our beliefs and our faith while still showing grace to others. Why do you pass judgment, Paul says? Or why do you despise your brother and sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. Right there, that Paul gives them an example. We all stand before God. You know, this is also, I'm going to slip this in because I was about... Uh, what's going on in the Middle East. Somebody this morning was saying that that you have to humanize the people. And he said, and he was, he was a Middle East expert, but he was, he was a Muslim. And he was saying um, that when you dehumanize people or you treat them like animals, they're going to act like animals. He said, what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to rehumanize people. In other words, who are we to stand in before the judgment of God? The seat of God, because God is the one who judges. And President Biden went over there and he told them, he said to... Uh, to uh, the Israelis, don't let your revenge cloud your vision. Well, for Christians, it goes on, and we say, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess and give praise to God. In other words, what is worship? Worship is recognizing God's grace, and God is the judgment, and the judge, and that we, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess and give praise to God. What is the response that we should have? Gratitude towards God. Worship is gratitude, and it's showing gratitude towards God. So as we meet new people, as we see new situations, as we meet people that don't believe as we believe, we just have to remember to be grateful Grateful that we are one of God's children. And so are they. Well, what about family conflicts? That's a church conflict. What about family conflict? Um, how many people have family wounds? I mean, how many people have gone to family reunions 
And there's always a little tension maybe about somebody or something that we have to survive these tensions over our lifetime. But I will tell you this, it's nothing compared to Joseph and what he had to go through with his family. Everything that happens to our families pales to what happens to Joseph. It says here, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back and, and, and for all the wrong that we did? I mean, they threw him in a, in a well and expected him to die. Of course, somebody came along and took him out and he becomes the number one guy in Egypt. But I would say that was, that was uh, uh, quite a family tension there. Your father gave this instruction. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did to you. So Joseph did. And he responds, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? There you are again. Am I the judge? I'm not the judge. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended me harm, God intended it for good in order to preserve the numerous people. So have no fear. And he speaks kindly to them. Now that's forgiveness. For them to forgive. You meant it for evil. But God intended it for good. And so the famine that they had in Israel. And they, had, they had to go find food. They found Joseph. Who of course was smart enough to put seven years of storage and seven years knowing there was going to be a seven years of famine so God they meant it for evil but God knew a bigger and greater plan and what's the response gratitude gratitude points us towards God and so we are grateful of these responses well now let's look at the uh, conflict in the church that's Matthew but you have to look at the passage before, Matt, before the one we read today on how to handle conflict in the church. It says, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens, you have regained one. If you haven't listened, take one or two of the others along with you so that every word may be confirmed in evidence of two or three witnesses. And if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender still refuses to, to listen to the church, let them be as one as the Gentile or tax collector. In other words, there's nothing else you can do. Well, that's the passage just before Peter's passage. So what does Peter say? Oh, that... That sounds good, but how many times do I have to do this? How many times do I have to forgive them? Maybe seven times? And then, uh, of course, uh, Jesus answers, no, no, 70 times seven. So before everybody gets their calculators out, tries to figure out 77 times, trying to add it up and keeping track, he really means Seven is perfection and forever. So he answers, For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began to reckon him, he owed him 10,000 talents. He couldn't pay. So he sold, together with his wife and his children, he ordered him to be sold and all his possessions. So the slave falls on his knees and pleads, you know, uh, to have patience. I'll pay you everything. Well, 10,000 talents is like saying $10 million. It's a ridiculous amount. So really, forgiveness was, and paying back the debt was not an option. The only option was forgiveness. Forever. Forgive it forever. And I think he knew that. So the, so the, the, the landowner says, and the Lord says, uh, I'll forgive you your debt. So what happens? We know. What happens is, is that he finds a fellow slave who owns him a hundred denarii, which is nothing. Seizes him by the throat and says, pay what you owe. And the fellow slaves, he falls down, says, have patience with me. And he says, no. And he throws him into prison. Well, when the fellow slaves saw this, they were greatly distressed. 
They reported to the Lord. And the Lord summoned him and said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all the, the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave? See, this is the challenge to us. The challenge is, is our forgiveness is tied to God's forgiveness. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. The two are tied together. Forgive our debts as we forgive others. If we don't forgive others, God doesn't forgive us if we forgive. It's tied together, and that's the challenge. Should you not have had mercy on your slave as I have had mercy on you? So... In the anger, the Lord hands them over to be tortured until he pays the entire debt, which he can't. So he said, so the Heavenly Father will do this to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and sister from the heart. Well, you know, I could have made this the fear, gone the fear route. You know, you better forgive or you'll be handed over for torture. But I don't think that's where this is going. I think this is going, it is not so much about this warning, you better or else, as much as an indication of where your heart is. If you do not forgive your brother and sister from the heart. Because you see, if we don't forgive, what does that show? It shows a lack of gratitude. For what God has done for us. God has forgiven this slave 10,000 talents. And we should be grateful. Because God has forgiven our 10,000 talents that we owe God. And so, that's where I want to go. Is that we need to show gratitude. Now, I used to forgive, uh, preach forgiveness as a way of self-care. Because, you know, that's kind of the big thing today when you read about forgiveness. What do they say? Well, you need to forgive so that you can release yourself from the burden of their sin. You need to let go. You need to release the anger. You need to release the hate. And you can only do that by forgiveness. I've preached sermons like that. You know, where forgive, and it's true. Forgiveness does help release the hate and, and, and all that you have internalized into yourself that that other person has done to you. The only way you can, can move on is to let go and forgive. But see, I don't, that's another sermon. This one is about community. This is about building relationships. This is about healing relationships and healing a community of faith. Or, in this case, healing a big war that's going on in the Middle East. And we believe, as Christians, this can't be done without forgiveness and grace. Whereas the Muslim is saying, we need to humanize people and not dehumanize them. They need to see them as all God's children. We would, we would go beyond that by saying not only that Old Testament belief, but we have moved to the New Testament of Jesus saying, you forgive. Oh, but you don't know what they've done to me. You forgive. I mean, Joseph was thrown into a well and left for dead. You forgive. That's where we are. That's how we believe relationships are healed. That's how we believe communities can be mended. I preached this when Maui was burning. And Oprah went on TV, and I don't know if you know the scandal, you know, 
You always have 24 news cycles, so it's gone now. There's new news. But at the time, Oprah was going to give $10 million along with The Rock, you know, Dwayne Johnson. $10 million, $1,000 to each victim of Maui. And she got criticized on social media. Still don't know quite why. But people were very upset that she was doing this and holier than thou or whatever. Or she owns land there. Why is she doing more? And they just panned her for doing this. She wanted to do it because Dolly Parton had done the same thing over in Gatlinburg or Dolly over in the Great Smoky Mountains had done the same thing for people there. So that's where they got the idea. Well, as she was on CBS this morning, they were talking about it. And then one of the people said to her, you know, because, you know, Oprah, you know, anybody who's famous is always getting criticized for something. So she says, how do you handle the criticism? Well, everybody's talking like this and everything. And, but I heard it. I don't know if everybody heard it. You know what she said? I have gratitude. I'm grateful for what I have. Wow. Why didn't you lift that up? You kept talking. Nobody heard. Hey, wait a minute. She just said she can handle criticism. She can forgive others. And she can do these things. Why? Because she's grateful. How do we live a life of grace among all the turmoil and all the hate speech that's out there? We listen to Paul. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. What a privilege. If we would read this passage every day, we could remind ourselves every day, how could we not be grateful? And in this gratefulness, begin to lead a life of grace. Amen. Well, let us, do we stand for the affirmation of faith or do we remain seated? We can remain seated. Let us offer that affirmation. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now we can turn to 335 and we can remain seated and sing our hymn. <laughs> for announcements.
Is there someone to share announcements? I suppose they're on the in the bulletin. I do know you're all invited afterwards for coffee mingle. I know that. Are there any others that need to be highlighted? Congregational meeting after church next week. Okay. And you promised that it'd be short. No, you didn't say that. You said it might be short. <laughs> uh, if there's none, are there prayers for the people? Are there prayers that, uh, that you would like to, to say, to highlight? No prayers today for individuals? Well, then let us offer our prayers. Lord, we offer these prayers this day as we come before you. Thankful for the many blessings that you have given us, and especially thankful that your son has, has sit, is, is sitting with you and interceding for us as we lift up our prayers. It gives us confidence then to approach you. And so this day, of course, we, we pray for the, the, the Middle East. And we know it's been a problem for years and years and decades, even hundreds of years, and even thousands of years. But we offer this prayer this day because we know it has completely surfaced now that which has been smoldering. And we pray, Lord, for, for continued insight and wisdom not only through us, but also through the leaders, that they will, will understand the pressures and perhaps find long-term solutions that will last forever. So we lift them up to you. And we lift up the, the prayers for, for Ukraine and Russia. And for those, uh, that war too, we, we lift up those prayers too, that again, the leaders will, will provide peace for those who just want to live peacefully. And we pray for those in Maui and in Hawaii as they rebuild their lives and rebuild their homes. We lift them up to you also, Lord, as to comfort them and to be with them. In fact, Lord, we pray that you comfort all those who are innocently suffering because of either natural disasters or disasters brought on by us. And Lord, this day we also offer prayers then for all the leaders of the world and also in our own country, whether it be national or local, we pray for them. And Lord, this day we pray for all those who teach, for all those that lift up people that are working with our children, that they may show grace and love to each child that they, they teach and are entrusted to. Lord, this day we pray for our churches. We pray for all those and we lift them up to you, those who bring the word, but those who hear the word. We're thankful, Lord, for the many churches that have been planted around the world and in this country. And we pray that you be with them as they, they lift up your word for the people and as signs of hope. Lord, this day we pray for those who are weak, who perhaps have no home, no place to stay, no clothes, no food. We, we pray that you keep us sensitive to their issues. We pray that you be with them too to give them hope. And so, Lord, we lift up all of these prayers unto you as we offer that prayer that your Lord, that your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now, I'm not sure of the tradition in this church. Do you pass the offering, or is the plate in the back? Or online? Or by check? Okay. Well, let us offer a prayer to receive the offerings. Lord, this day... 
we offer this prayer to, to receive the offerings that we are about to receive. Thankful, Lord, for the gifts that you have given us, and we ask that you use these gifts to continue to further your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now we'll sing the doxology. Now our closing hymn is Amazing Grace, and it's found on page 280 of your blue hymnal. Now go in peace and serve the Lord and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.